I wanted to introduce myself, what we're doing, a little bit of Bhutan, which is not quite as unknown as it used to be because recently there was a Bill Weir did a, did a CNN on it. I hope some of you saw it. It was very good on Gross National Happiness, two weeks on CNN. And then Prince William and Kate were there uh, a week ago last Monday. So it's actually been in, in, in the news for, for America. But uh, since it's a school of public health and I have a degree in public health and I'm a physician and I'm working in healthcare in Bhutan, I wanted to make this health oriented. So I just want to make sure that everybody is good with that because we can go with a little more of the history, social, environmental, political, religious, Bhutan has everything you could, you could possibly want. Uh, but this is focused on stomach cancer. Uh, there's a reason for that, and we'll get to the epidemiology in the middle of this, and then there's some very particular approaches to it which I think influence the solution which they may take. Um, so it's called Challenges of Stomach Cancer in Bhutan, and I tried to make a few notes which I'm going to refer to mainly to keep myself on track because I want to introduce you to the country, a little bit to me, to the foundation, and to stomach cancer, and then we have a problem to discuss. Because basically, I'm here to get information for our work there, and I'm also, to be perfectly honest, recruiting. Because I have always thought that ETSU particularly, Dr. Wyckoff, this is a large part of it, but not exclusively, ETSU, I think, is the right place to be working for Bhutan. And I've worked with Harvard, I've worked with Yale, we won't go into why I think there shouldn't be there, but I think there are some very good reasons why ETSU should be, and I think all I have to do is show you a few pictures and you'll see 60% of why it should be, and the rest will fill in. So your perspective on their problems in stomach cancer can be very practical to us as we try to help them craft solutions. Targeting risk and conserving the natural microbiome. And I'm just going to touch on natural microbiome. There's a whole course in that. It's one of the most exciting things. There are two organs that we have been discovering since I went to medical school 40 years ago. One is the fascia. We thought the connective tissue was just that, it connected tissue. Guess what? It's not. It's an organ of structure. So that gives us a whole new view of how the body works in physics. And the other is the microbiome. We used to think they were just the commensals that live in our gut. Guess what? They're not. They're part of our body, and they're, they're part of the natural environment, which makes us part of the natural environment. We're mainly discovering that in terms of immunity, but there's also some patho pathology here with Helicobacter pylori, with H. pylori. So, the natural microbiome is part of our approach to this issue, particularly you'll see why in Bhutan. Now the kingdom of Bhutan is Tibet in the north, India in the south. That already gives you uh, misinformation because it's actually China and the part of India that you're not allowed to go to. So you cannot go to Kalimpong, you cannot go to this part of India because it's dangerous there's, um, there's insurgency, it's also the oil producing area, and it's restricted. So the only way to get into Bhutan is by air. So it's restricted access. You cannot get there over land. So that means it's completely isolated. They have absolutely control of who comes in and who goes out. It is a kingdom. The mountains run east-west at the bottom and north-south at the top, which is important because Tibet's at the top, so that means it's part of the Tibetan culture and basically walled off from the rest of the world. The Timpu is in the west. If you go to Bhutan, this is where you will go. We work in the most isolated region of the most isolated country on Earth. The challenges here, the secondary challenges, are also to make what we do culturally appropriate, effective, and affordable. The Tashi, the, it's a constitutional monarchy now. It's the world's youngest democracy. Constitution established in 2008. Anybody interested in political science? You want to see a country build a democracy? They're actually doing it. It's very exciting. Being pushed by one of the most remarkable royal families today. We honor Her Majesty the Queen of England. That is a remarkable family. This family is incredibly remarkable. The Wangchuks became king of Bhutan, the Ugin Wangchuk, uh, 100 years ago, 1906, 110 years ago. We are now in the fifth generation of that family. 
it was an absolute monarchy uh, up until 2008. Now it's a constitutional monarchy. And His Majesty speaks of the government as if it were something from him. This is something that the king had to convince the people that they needed a parliament and they needed a democracy and a constitution. He abdicated in 2008. The new one took over in 2009. He'd been prepared since birth to be king. Um, I work for, I work with those who work with the sister of the fourth king, I can't tell you the history, there's not enough time, but basically she and her mother, the royal queen grandmother, eliminated leprosy with a doctor who brought me to Bhutan in 1983. That's the short story. So I work with the government, I don't work for the government. I really work for Aji. What I do is for Aji. I, I, I won't, it always makes me cry to talk about her, so we won't go into that now. She's so extraordinary, but she is the one who gives us the guidance of what we should do. And a couple of years ago, I said, well, I've got these medical students, we've got this project, what, what should we do? She said, we need a CT scanner in Mongar, and we have stomach cancer, so hence the stomach cancer. The housing, this is a traditional house. That's why it may be a little difficult to get at the village. We're looking for something smaller to see if we can get a Bhutanese farmhouse into the village. But this is a traditional farmhouse. The animals are on the ground floor, the people are on the second floor, and storage is on the third floor. What that means is the people, the animals, and the microbiome is all there together. It's really primordial. And as you go east, you go farther and farther back in time, and so you're actually going to a microbiome which has never been changed, except by one generation of essential antibiotics sometime. So it's almost in its pristine state. The, uh, the third king, Jigme Dorji Wangchuk, started modernizing in the 60s, built the National Referral Hospital in Timpu, built the first hospitals. The first hospitals were leprosy hospitals. The epid leprosy was the most common disease in Bhutan. The first four hospitals they built were leprosy hospitals. And that's why the leprosy program was so important because leprosy like TB can be treated if it's diagnosed to take your medicines. So it's public health right away. It's health education, it's diagnosis, it's treatment. Um, and he started the Western Clinical Services. He said the Ministry of Health will be over traditional and Western uh, medicine. He said uh, we're going to make uh, services. So I was brought in in 1983 as the first pediatrician, 35 years ago. So that was a generation and a half ago now. Um, huge changes have been made. Now they have a neo ICU. They just invite, um, opened their PD ICU. They have um, sub uh, specialty services. The neo ICU, they have ventilators, total peripheral, peripheral nutrition, uh, exchange transfusions, everything that they've done in 25 years. From nothing to that. Believe me, when I was there, there was nothing. Because I know I'm nothing, and I was there, and I was it. And so, uh, I mean, my daughter was buried there. Uh, oops, born there. Maybe she will be buried there. She hasn't, we were talking about that today. My daughter was born there because at the time my, my wife, uh, we're still very close, uh, was also eager to go to Bhutan and she was 33 weeks pregnant so she went there and had a baby. Um, we were there for a year and came back. She's the only American ever born there. Uh, she's not a Bhutanese citizen. There is no birthright citizenship in Bhutan. Uh, she's never been back. So maybe she will go back there and be buried. Um, but it was nothing to a lot, and they've taken care of the mortality rates. Mortality rates are low, immunization rates are high, literacy rates are high. Now they're at the stage of building the secondary medical services. This is Tong Sa Zong, which is the center of government up until the country was formed. Every valley had a Zong. There are 20 of them in the country. They're still the centers of the courts, civil administration and the monar and, and the, uh, the monks. A third of the population are in the monasteries. So there's actually a head of the monk body and a head of state. So it's, it's like if everywhere you went, a third of the people see are Franciscan monks, you'd have a very different environment for which you to live in. So the civilians are immersed in this traditional world which is continually reinforced. When interacting with the, with the West and talking about being a poor country and gross national product, had nothing. 
So you don't want to say it's zero. And they have this rich culture. And he said, well, really, we consider it important that how, how you live your life as, to, as opposed to only how much you have to live it with. And so the four pillars of, of gross national happiness, which is a term which people are not familiar with, are very familiar. Good governance, environmental conservation, sustainable socioeconomic and development, and cultural preservation. Everybody gets that. He just called it gross national happiness. Now, if you're interested in this, go to the web, Google it, and see how they have operationalized this in the Gross National Happiness Commission, which actually looks at every project. Now, I get around that by working with a ministry. We have a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Health. We say, what do you want us to help you with? And that way, they're determining the priorities. But Bill Weir's st story was on gross national happiness. And he talked to people on the streets. And they'll say, yes, they're happy. It works. But remember, it's very isolated. And they can keep it isolated. And that's part of the reason why it works. They do have a rising problem with depression and suicide. So it's not Shangri-La. It's not paradise. But it is changing. But on average, people are happy. They, they measure it, and they go for it. Health is part of that, and it's considered a right. Government provides health for everybody. Everybody gets the same health. If they have no CT scanner in the East, nobody gets a CT scanner. If they have to have one and they live, they'll get one in India. So that's why they needed a CT scanner in the East and the South. Everybody has, they get, it's the only country in the world that I know of that provides free HPV for everybody. Cancer control, vaccine for, for teens for, for, H, for, for human papillomavirus, everybody gets it in Bhutan. It's very expensive and they pay for it. Um, measles, rubella, mumps, immunization rates high, uh, clinic rates down, She's standing next to a baby warmer. And this is in a basic health unit in the region away from the capital. They have pushed health care out very well. Now what they're building are centralized services and attacking chronic diseases. That's why this story is important, because when you control the diarrheal diseases, the infectious diseases, what develops are the chronic diseases. And they're finding that mental health is a chronic disease that comes along with the metabolic ones. This is. Tashi Gong Zong, just another Zong. There are 20 of these. And those were the skyscrapers of the country. Now they're building a modern, modern cities around that. Um, in 1983, when I was there, I was young, my wife having babies. We had one other, so I guess you can call that two. Um, and uh, Kado's wife was young and having babies. And you know, we didn't know anything about Bhutan. They didn't know anything about us. And I traveled the world, like Randy said. I grew up in hope. I traveled the world by the time I was 16. And I was completely at a loss. Well, here, Sangi down the street was having babies. She just had one. And so naturally, we became very friendly. And Kado became, didn't seem to have much time, had a lot of time on his hands. So we became friends. So my contact there has been Dasho Kado. Dasho means sir. He's been honored subsequently by the king. Um, that's Kado. He's very distinguished. Um, turns out he was uh, one of the youth that was chosen to be educated with the fourth king. So he's very close to the fourth king. And then he became the bodyguard of the fourth king. And he's big. He's a colonel, and he's big. He's a big, deep voice, and everybody knows him. Um, he traveled the country with the fourth king. The kings there travel. Traditionally, they will serve the people. They will go out and serve. Everybody will be out in the field, and they'll be giving out the, and they're always accessible. It's very accessible. So he is a good driver. Yes, sir? Didn't the fourth king have four queens? Yes. Yes. Stay with one for a while and then go to the next and go to the Well, actually, they're all sisters. They tended to live together. We lived here. They lived over here at night. The jeep would go up. Nobody talk about it. Actually, the fourth king, the fifth king had been born, and nobody knew. I lived in Bhutan. I never knew that there was a crown prince. Monarchy is a very different kind of thing, particularly in a very small place. But he married four sisters, um, each one more beautiful and gracious 
the, than the next. And uh, after Cotto was with His Majesty for four years, then he was adjutant to the Four Queens. So he knows the whole country. The whole, and we are very fortunate because he is the one that is our host and takes my students to the East. That's how we go to the East, and you don't. You know, because Cotto goes to the East and says, oh, they're with me. OK, and so off they go. These are yak herders from Merak, some of the people that we work for, very isolated. They may well be the husbands of the lady standing forward, and those her sisters. They have polyandry there in that part. They have more than one husband in the, among the yak herders of, of the eastern part of Bhutan. Now, that's Cotto that I know. This is the Cotto that I never knew he was. This is the fifth king. This is the crown prince who was born six weeks ago and just named last week. His name is Na, uh, Jigmi Namgi Wangchuk. And that's Kato, right there. So you can imagine we have access to the country of a person who at royal functions is in the picture. We are very fortunate. And he came saying, oh, I'm just the driver. I said, yeah, right, some driver. He's really wonderful. He really cares very much. I don't, I don't know why. I can't say her name in public. He cares very much for Aji. And, and they are the core that we're really set up to, to serve. Um, he is very close to the royal queen grandmother. So I feel like our priority is really well plugged into what they want. And they said, number one, stomach cancer. OK. I did go back. That was 10 years ago. Mote, who was my intern, is now retired as a head of radiology. It's amazing to see how fast development can be. Now, this is now. Right now, Alyssa, our fourth year medical student, is there working on projects. Long story short about equipment donation, because it's going to be a, about stomach cancer. Um, CT scan they need desperately in the east uh, because of the roads. You can't transport people to it, so people die. Um, and we've been trying to get a CT scanner for several years as unsuccessfully as everybody else. And then we started partnering with other people who do that. And Rad8 International is a group of radiologists that get machines for institution, imaging, training, um, all kinds of radiology services. And they are very eager to work in Bhutan because Bhutan's starting the whole thing. They can start it from scratch, do a pediatric radiology program the way they, they want it done. So we're partnering with Rad8 International, and they require, which is good, good public health practice, where do you start? Tell me what you need. You start with an assessment. You don't go in, I'm here to. You know, you say, OK, tell me what you need. So they do it. They have a very detailed assessment that they do for the institutions, for the ministry. And we've been working for the last three years to help the Bhutanese get this. I think Alyssa is finally going to get the last information on the all three hospitals. And then we can hand over the, this program to Rad8 and say, OK, we helped you get your assessment. Now, she's learning at the same time doing her own project. So they do this for credit for George Washington University. Now I'm on the faculty there. Um, and she is with the staff at the regional hospital. She will be there <clears throat> for the next couple of days and then coming back. So we're going to see if we can find a house that we could possibly bring there, because that would be really interesting. Now, stomach cancer. And the region, this is a World, a World Bank map. Darker is less resources. Uh, you can just see from the geography, from the, from the geography, how the geology is. You'll notice they run north-south, the different provinces, because that's the way the mountains run. So that means when you go from Timpu here to Mongar there, you're going like this. You know, and land in the, the Himalayas, the land in Himalayas looks like this, like that, literally. In Tashigong, the city of Tashigong, when you walk out on your pout, your porch, you're looking at the roof of the house on the next street. And you're at the base of the house on the next street because everything's built on hill. Well, that's good for exercise. <laughs> but what does it do for water? Where's the water? Water's down there. So what Bhutan has is hydroelectric power. 
because I have seven valleys shaped like this, all of the Himalayan runoff and all of the rain coming down by the time it goes. And these valleys may be 14,000 feet. They may go from 18,000 or 18,000 feet to 2,000 feet. All of that energy is in the water. And so they now have turbines and they're exporting energy to India. So that's where their economic development will come from. But they don't have much in terms of roads or infrastructure. You can't fly around the country because high mountains, bad weather, forget it. Now, stomach cancer. This is uh, Globacan 2012 WHO figures, the prevalence of stomach cancer, uh, gastric carcinoma, highest in Korea, Mongolia, and Japan. Japan's important because they have a, an approach, a public health model of eradication of one of the causes. Now, one of the things is you get stomach cancer late in life. Uh, I, I, stomach cancer in children is extremely rare, and in teens and young adults, it's very rare. It gets more common as you get older. Part of that is a pathological process. But if you actually look for Bhutan in the list, this is age standardized rates, so they're, they're comparable. Uh, Bhutan is 13th overall for the rate. And then as you break it down by gender, it's more common in men than women. It's 18th. And in women, it's 18th. So there are different ways of measuring and different, um, different errors and different ways of sampling. But it's very high. What that translates into is everybody knows somebody who has stomach cancer. As a matter of fact, Dr. Nyatt, who brought me there in 1983, died last year of stomach cancer. So stomach cancer is without doubt very common by any measure that they have. And then you look at different studies. Um, we can give you a copy of, of these. Um, they're very good studies. They're fairly recent. The oldest, oldest one, I think, is just 2013. So they're, they're very recent. Now, Dorji is the, uh, he's the gastroenterologist at the referral hospital. Dashi Dendop is the uh, oncology surgeon. Hoda Malati is an epidemiologist and a microbiome researcher in Baylor. Uh, these two are in the pathology department, and Jim Richter is a gastroenterologist at Harvard. So it's a group effort that's looking into the epidemiology of helicobacter and gastric carcinoma. We'll go into the in these assumptions. These are what we think we know about stomach cancer and the microbiome. The human microbiome is essential to health. I think we'll all agree on that. That didn't used to be the case. Now we're starting more and more and more. I highly recommend, as an introduction, Martin Blazer's book, The, the Missing Microbes. Now, Martin, Martin Blazer is at NYU. He's the head of the microbiome project at NIH and is looking at, he's the one who actually explained why, if you get a teeny tiny little bit of antibiotic to chickens, they get fat. The reason has nothing to do with treating infection, like the media would have you believe. The reason is a little bit of antibiotic changes the microbiome. It's very sensitive. And so a little antibiotic changes the microbiome. And he's actually shown that if you give antibiotics to mankind, it results in, drum roll, obesity. This to me makes, this is, I go into McDonald's and I look at people and I think, when I was a kid, nobody was ever that big. How did they get that big so fast? I mean, people are literally this wide. It's not unusual. And I remember one person when I was a child who was this wide. And everybody talked about how wide she was. It was that unusual. There's a huge change in our body habitus that's happening. Uh, and not that much has changed about our lifestyle, our exercise, our, our, other, our, our diet. What's really changed is our microbiome, I think. So thank you very much. So Martin actually has shown that if you change the microbiome so that it makes animals, so that the organism, basically it has to do with what's digested, what's absorbed, how it interacts with the body, with the absorption in the gut. The gut's very active. These organisms actually interact. They don't just 
sit like a ma like a fecal mass in the colon. They're actually interacting with all of the this, the um, the cells, and the the Helicobacter actually fuse to the stomach cells, and they exchange genetic material with us. The H. pylori, if you got it, it's part of you, and you are part of them. This is, this is why I say H. pylori is part of the microbiome. This is a bit of a controversy in medicine. A lot of doctors would say H. pylori is a pathogen that causes cancer. I say H. pylori is part of the microbiome that's part of the cause of cancer. And it's really complicated. Those complications make a difference in Bhutan, I think. Um, we do know that H. pylori is part, uh, when, it's, when it, you get it, not everybody has it. Uh, maybe 8% in America may have H. pylori, I, I think, between 3 and 8. Um, I think in, in Japan it, it's, it's much higher, maybe 60s, 50, 60%. I don't, I, I don't know in Japan. We'd have to look it up. But not everybody gets it. But when you get it, you get it young, and you tend to keep it. Now, everybody who has it gets this is really cool, and I will digress on this because it's so fascinating. Everybody, H. pylori is a bacteria, right? What do bacteria do? They cause inflammation, right? Well, guess what? They're different kinds of inflammation, and they're different places. H. pylori is the only organism that lives in the acid of the stomach. It lives in the distal part of the stomach where there's high acid, and it causes a chronic inflammation. And if you look at the inflammation pathologically, it's not the acute inflammation of a boil. It's a chronic inflammation of helper of suppressor lymphocytes, T suppressor lymphocytes in a mixture with others. It's, I'm sure it's microbiology. It's, it's more complicated than that. But basically, you have a whole gathering of immunologically suppressive cells at the opening of the, of the <coughs> digestive tract. That's significant because it's known that when you eradicate H. pylori for whatever reason, you just if you have it, you do this in animals. You give them H. pylori, great. Uh, you get rid of it, great. They get fat, great. They also get asthma. They get autoimmune disease. Now, why does that make sense? Well, because if the H. pylori and the immune system are somehow working on allergens and responses, they may be removing some important breaks on over-response that results in autoimmune disease. All of this is very new. I mean, the, the, this, this is real basic science. Don't read too much about this, or you'll leave public health and go into basic science. It's so fascinating. But the truth is. A lot of people have H. pylori. About 10% of people who have it will get the stomach cancer. However, look at people with stomach cancer. 90% of them have the H. pylori. So there's really a, an important causative function of H. pylori in the people who get stomach cancer. And it progresses. Inflammation to ulcer to cancer. If you're symptomatic, and most of the studies that we looked at were done at the hospitals in Paro and Timpu on people who had stomach pain, who came in. Um, it's everybody agrees that once you have symptoms and it's starting to progress, you need to treat it, and you can prevent cancer. So if you treat H. pylori, so there's no doubt, I, I don't think there's any controversy in clinicians, that if a person has uh, symptomatic infection of H. pylori, you should eradicate the H. pylori. And it's tough to get rid of. It's not like a strep throat. It's hard to get rid of because, after all, it's in the stomach. Um, so you have to use a triple antibiotic regimen. You can't use just one. You have to use at least three. You have to use it for a long time and usually for multiple courses. That's the way it's treated by gastroenterologists. If you have stomach pain, you go in, they say you've got H. pylori, you're going to get rid of it. They'll give you on a triple antibiotic, and they'll go back and test to make sure it's gone, and very often you have to take another. Now, that antibiotic goes everywhere. So everything else in your, in your stomach, in your microbiome is affected. One of the fascinating things about the microbiome, it tends to be the same for you. It will be altered by an, uh, a, antibiotic, but a period later, you'll be back to pretty close what it was before. There's kind of a homeostasis in the microbiome, even though these organisms are changing every 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and there are millions and billions of them. It's incredibly fascinating how you get stability in that sort of system. That's probably getting into philosophy. Um, so the microbiome gets changed. You can't, can't, 
can't not happen. If you're going to have the effect of the antibiotic, it's going to change the microbiome, and it's going to change everything. Uh, triple antibiotic therapy seriously affects the microbiome of the person, needs more investigation, but that is one of our assumptions. Antibiotics are new to Bhutan, that's a fact. Um, and essential antibiotics, so there hasn't been a whole lot of exposure. So this is where the conservation of the microbiome comes into the, into the, into the mix in Bhutan. If it's true that, very, that the eastern regions of Bhutan are very remote, that's true. They're very isolated, that's true. They've been unaffected by social change, that's true. And the microbiome is a stable biologic entity which is part of us. And people who've been studying the microbiome find that those places like isolated tribes in South America where you look at the microbiome, guess what? It's much more complicated. It's much more, has much more variety. It's more responsive. It gets simpler. Fewer organisms, less responsive as it changes and people get a modern diet and modern medical care. But our belief is, and we don't know this yet because nobody's been to the East to do it, all the people from the East have come to the West in Bhutan to get their tests, um, is that the microbiome in, in Bhutan could be the way it has been forever. And there's no place else, I mean, drum roll, no place else on work like that, literally. We are so privileged to be working in a place which is absolutely unique on Earth. Because everybody, everywhere else has gotten connected. Eastern Bhutan is not connected. And they are the way they were 2,000, 3,000 years ago. So this is a chance for people who want to understand the biology of the microbiome and human beings and see how it changes to really understand some of those basics. So one of the things we want to help to do, our foundation, is to get academics in America interested and first of all, know it's there, know what's going on. When you get a, a photo op of Prince William, you don't get crap about this. You know, so you may have seen pictures of Bhutan, don't tell you anything about the East. So we gotta let people know what's out there. And it's really fascinating and really interesting. And it could be really important to drum roll, obesity, anybody here in public health know the effects of obesity? If we had a handle on that, what we could do for diabetes, hypertension, cancer. So anyway, um, Ardith, who was there and gave birth to Winona, who, by the way, is named. You know who she's named after. Um, she, is, she went on to become an expert in, in breastfeeding and breast milk. Well, she became very interested in microbiome because of newborn babies, necrotizing endocolitis, because he's always known as pediatricians. If you can give breast milk to a preemie, they have, they're going to be protected from neck. Well, now they're starting to know why. Because breast milk has elements that affect the development of the microbiome. And the microbiome, uh, the microenvironment of a baby with necrotizing enocolitis and a similar baby without are different. And this is all relates to nutrition and the microbiome and stuff going on here. So um, she's very interested in trying to find out things like do they give colostrum? Um, uh, do they, uh, how many are breastfed? Well, guess what? Yes and yes. So it's a place for people to go learn about the microbiome, but also coming to the bad part. This is all good. This is all a good part. Um, uh, constraint is healthcare is paid for by the royal government. That's it. Everybody gets it. So what they pay for this, they don't pay for that. That means that what they pay for you to go to India to get your CT scanner because they don't have it in Mongar, that means somebody's not getting an X-ray because they have one pot of money and they will send you to India if you need it. And they do that and it is expensive and it takes a lot of foreign exchange. So that's why they need to bring in the equipment to get it closer to where the people are. But they don't have a lot of money to spend on expensive antibiotics or eradication programs. So foreign exchange for healthcare is very limited. Now we put that, that's the good stuff. The microbiome, it's really cool. This lot, yeah. Bad stuff. Every study we've had about H. pylori, we know that the gross measure of prevalence is high. Everybody says stomach cancer is high. You look at the rates of colonization with my, uh, H. pylori consistent in all these studies. 
Central region, eastern region, and western region are the mountainous regions. Southern region is a little more diverse. There are more um, uh, non-Tibetan type people there, more uh, Indian people. There's more different genetic mix, different environment. 60% in the south is still high. And the incidence, correspondingly high. From these, these are people who are symptomatic studies. We need to get people who can go to the field and do studies because you can, there are five ways of measuring H. pylori. Some of them are just as simple as a breath, breathalyzer. So the prevalence of H. pylori in, in, the, in the community volunteers by these methods in Western Bhutan cities was as high as 73%. Now, among the symptomatic, it's higher. That's why the, the numbers are different. So 73% of the people out there have H. pylori. That's a lot of people at risk for stomach cancer, especially if we don't know who's going to get it and who isn't, which could be related to who knows what. Among those with gastritis, ulcer, and duodenal ulcer, the rate's even higher, 90%. And to confirm that anecdotally, in the series that they did with people who all they knew was they had stomach pain, they went ahead and did the endoscopy and they did the biopsy. They determined that five of those had diagnosable stomach cancer and they didn't know it. Five out of 372. That's, and one of them had duodenal cancer. Now if you look at these strains, 83% show resistance to metronidazole, which is the foundational of the inexpensive eradication regimen. Because metronidazole also works for parasites and it's been worked to control intestinal parasites in Bhutan. So the H. pylori now is resistant to it. So that means you have to go to levofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, or clarithromycin. Clarithromycin looks clinically like the best approach. It's also way more expensive. So extremely expensive regimen to eradicate one person who needs it. So metronidazole is not recommended. Some of the recent uh, inf data from Baylor suggests that there all may also may be more uh, aggressive strains in Bhutan, which may account for the higher rate of stomach cancer. We know that the H. pylori rate is high. So when approaching stomach cancer, well, first of all, they have one endoscope in the east. They have three in the west. They need more equipment, so that's part of what we do. And we're working with other people who do that. The government wants to say, how do we approach this? Well, this is the question. We know there's a high infection rate, if you will, or colonization rate, if you prefer, of H. pylori way above anything we've seen most anywhere else in the world. We know there's a corresponding high rate of stomach cancer, and from that we reason there's a high risk of stomach cancer in those that have it, so therefore it's a high priority problem. Well, Japan is in a similar situation, and they have decided to do a national eradication program, and they are now engaged on a national eradication of H. pylori. Well, there are couple of issues in Bhutan that come to our mind, but that's one of the options. Now, we're trying to move our way away from people simply thinking H. pylori, bad, H. pylori, stomach cancer, bad. Because H. pylori could be good. Because I went back to my records. I, I established the pediatric record program. And of course, I had, had to have some idea of what was going on with these hundreds of people that were coming to me when I was a pediatrician there in 83. So I have a book at home which has a patient's name, origin, diagnosis, and disposition. Okay? Every child that was admitted from anywhere in the country came through my capable hands. So hopefully some of them left better. But uh, many of them did. A lot of them died because I told them they're going to die because they're going to come here last and they're going to be dying when they get here. We're going to do our best and we're going to fail. And that's true. The mortality rate in the first year of pediatrics on the ward was 20%. One in five died. That's how sick they were when we were admitted them. And I believe me, I was not going to admit anybody that I was not going to be willing to stay up all night over because I was the only one to stay up all night. So there was kind of, there was a pretty good triage there. And I looked in my list. I had not one case of asthma, not one. And now they have it. Hmm, interesting, isn't it?
You take the work of Martin Blazer in animals, you take some of the work of H. pylori in, in, in gastroesophageal reflux and asthma and eradication, a change in the microbiome. It very well could be that Japan is about to create an epidemic of diseases that they didn't have before they got rid of the H. pylori. I, God, there's, there's PhD studies galore here. This is, this is such, there's so much we don't know about this. And they're doing it right now. So first of all, the government can't afford to give everybody a triple antibiotic with, with so, so that's out. You're going to have to find more money if that's what they want to do. If they want to do that, they not only are changing the microbiome in the people that have H. pylori, they are altering it in the environment. This is now, in my mind, environmental, go ahead, like what I think the concerns are, environmental preservation. You're changing Eastern Bhutan. You're going to change the microbiome in everybody if you eradicate it. Now, if you target, you may not change it in everybody. We don't know. But how do you target? Well, you have to diagnose. How do you diagnose? You have to get out there. How do you get out there? You have to get health care. How do you get health care? People have to find money for it. The best way, I think, is to combine it with research. So OK, let's, let's find out what the epidemiology. Now, interestingly, the direction that Ardeth has taken in her research has not been antibiotics, but probiotics and prebiotics. Because she has discovered that if you have a prebiotic, which is an oligosaccharide that occurs in the breast milk, and it's taken in by the gut, that changes this is very cool. That changes not the bacteria. It doesn't kill the bacteria, the bad bacteria. What it does is it kind of muzzles them. That is, they have the E. coli that the other babies have, but the E. coli doesn't produce disease. It changes the behavior somehow. So a prebiotic in the gut can change the behavior of the organisms that are there. Now, of course, what she's interested in is you can treat E. coli with prebiotics. They've shown that. It actually, there's a dose response effect. So this opens up a whole new class of medication to treat infections with. You don't kill the organism, you, you blunt it. And the prebiotics, probi uh, probiotics are other organisms that might compete with the bad actors. So she would like to see, well, what if they gave prebiotics to people who are out there that may protect them from stomach cancer and wouldn't change the microbiome. What a nice option that would be. So that's one of the options. The problems here is the government really, the science doesn't tell them what to do. Science says what, what if you eliminated H. pylori, you will eliminate 90% of your cancer, stomach cancer. You also probably will introduce other, and I've got, I believe it because I've, I've seen it, and I asked the pediatrician now, do you see pediatric? Do you see asthma? Oh, yeah. You have admissions for asthma? Oh, yeah. I never even saw a wheeze. Nothing. Of course, I did see TB of every organ, every organ in the body, and not so much of the lungs. I mean, I was obviously in a different pathology period. So, the so uh, if, if you were to, what, if the ministry were to come here and say, put your scientific minds together, I just kind of wanted to hear some of your thoughts about what approach do we? First, first question is, clearly, much as I love him, which is dearly, and he doesn't make me cry, uh, the, my, uh, Jim Richter at Harvard, the epidemiologist, he wants to go get those bad H. pylori. <laughs> you know, he wants to go get them, and we want to get rid of them. We'll find a way to do it. We'll do the endoscopy. We'll do the diagnosis. And we're absolutely together up to the diagnosis part, because I want to know what the epidemiology of disease is, too. Yeah. How good are the screening tools? Pretty good and pretty durable. So yes, it's now possible to, do, uh, to take it into the field. And also, remember, they have cold chain. They have um, a cold chain that takes their vaccines all the way out to the remote BHUs, which means you can get frozen samples back. I mean, that's the first thing Ardeth says, oh, can I get frozen poop? You know, because she works on frozen poop. And so you can get stool samples back. So, so the, the logistics are good. Um, okay. The screening tests are good. You have a 90% prevalence rate, so I mean, if you're going to treat just carriage, you're going to treat almost everybody anyway. Right. 
<coughs> if you were going to treat, yeah. right, and the, that's one of the important questions. Are you going to, what are your criteria? This is what I mean by targeted risk. Do you, you need to, you, what protocol would you set up in order to, we're not going to answer that, but now in a short time, but what protocol would you set up for a combination of history, symptom, and and finding to say, okay, we will presumptively treat you and expect you to be protected. Targeted. Yeah, a positive screening test and symptoms. Right, positive screening test and symptoms. Yeah, but you're still talking about treating sizable. And you could be a bit more aggressive because you could say, okay, we're gonna take that protocol to the population rather than wait for them to come in. Because you could be passive and say, oh, if you don't say you come with stomach pain and I ask you and you deny, I'm not going to give it to you. Um, the, a lot of people with stomach pain. Yeah, there are all other causes of stomach pain than, than H. pylori and certainly than even gastritis. And, is, there any, is there any genetic? Um, oh, that's a wonderful question. Yeah, that's a good, th that the answer is we don't know, but there very well could be because there's some fascinating studies of H. pylori in Latin America, <clears throat> which is a lovely mix of genetics from different people. And there do tend to be, simplistically, four different types, uh, Amerindian, African, European, and Asian genotypes, uh, genotypes in humans and the same kind of parallel in H. pylori. And the match of the two seems to be related epidemiologically to who gets stomach cancer and who doesn't. Now this is for somebody who wants a PhD in epidemiology. If you can figure this out, you got a really good degree there. The genetics of H. pylori and, and the host. Well, we can't change the genetics of the host. We can over time but that will change over generations. We might be able to change the, H, the genetics of H. pylori, but at least we could find out. Well, since we're getting near the end, I'll say what our approach is. Ardith and I have thought about this, and we said, okay, we don't know enough. We would like to get in there. I mean, it, this is so frustrating to our Bhutanese partners. It's like, uh, I'm not the most popular person in Bhutan, and the people know what I'm trying to do, because they say, where's our CT scanner? Where is our CT scanner? And I say, I do not know. It's out there somewhere still. It's not here. Say, we know that. Our people are dying. So they, where there's a need, they, they need a response. So we need to show that we're working towards it. We say, well, look, OK, we're building a partnership that will get it to you and be patient with us. When it comes to stomach cancer, we don't know what the microbiome like is out that way. Well, the people, part of the microbiome project, are now mapping it, just like the genomic pro, pro, program. They're now mapping the microbiome. And Martin Blazer's wife, Maria Dominguez Bayo, is um, she's actually banking. Ooh, banking poop. Why would we bank poop? Well, guess what? We treat with it now. You've heard of fecal transplant? What's that about? That's about a microbiome. You sterilize the gut, and you put in there something that you know will treat it. So the microbiome is like breast milk. So you can see why Ardith is excited about this, because there are a lot of similarities to breast milk work. We need to know what the microbiome is. We need to know what the epidemiology is. Prebiotics. Um, they drink a lot of beer in the East. Now, Buddhists are not supposed to drink beer. This is Bhutan. This is Bhutanese Buddhism. They drink a lot of beer in the East, and they make it themselves, and they feed it to children. And what's beer made with? A probiotic, yeast. So they have this naturally occurring probiotic that they're taking at the same time they have a high prevalence rate of H. pylori. Is this protective? Could beer be protective of stomach cancer? There may be some money in that, you know? Anybody know any brewers? But I mean, the, the, the yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. And they also uh, eat a lot of yogurt too. Oh, yeah. dairy. What what are they? Diet. Dairy, too. yogurt, butter. Um, yeah, uh, and they eat rancid butter. Getting more interesting. They take. They don't eat as much yogurt as they do in the Middle East. They drink most of their milk, but they make it into butter. After all, they have so much butter in Tibet. What do they use for lamps in the temples? Butter. Or butter lamps. You all those lamps in front of those are all butter. 
real butter. Um, and they make yak butter, which is very high in milk fat. So, and they have probiotics there. They also have bacteria from foods, food storage issues. You know, if the bad ones don't give you, don't get you, you might get benefit from the good ones that are there. Um, so probiotics. So the question is, what could we add? Um, the other question is, what are the, what's the incidence, the prevalence? Our hope is to get a symposium there. Our approach is, okay, let's, let's try to use the intellects of the West and the money that funds it to get to Bhutan and to try to get the microbiome leadership, the gastroenterologists, and the public health people all together to say, let's talk about it. And we want somebody there saying, we don't want you changing our microbiome. We need some placard-bearing environmentalists saying, this is a conservation issue. It's against our constitution to eradicate. Oh, that would be nice to hear, you know, but I don't, I don't know if we're going to hear it. Um, and uh, so one of the intermediate steps is we're looking for a smallish grant of about $50,000 to take the research she's done with E. coli, where they have a, 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 a in vitro model with the E. coli and the prebiotic to do the H. pylori and prebiotic show the same effect that may be enough to say, let's take it to the field. So I think our, our goal is in the next couple of years is to, is to spread the word among the people in stomach cancer and microbiome, say, listen, let me tell you about Eastern Bhutan and try to get something there so they can get graduate education and things like that, some academic sponsorship. But we just don't have the data to tell them what to do, except try to find the people who need it. Do better targeting, because the people that they had were volunteers who came to their clinic. So at least we could get, oh, and another thing we need to do is start getting cancer registries, because they don't know what the incidence of stomach cancer is. So we're working to help improve the tumor registry, get the diagnostic equipment, develop. Those of you involved in research know that education is a very important priority to this government. And they have just established a university of medical sciences, which is not, never be large enough to train medical students. They train their own auxiliary nurse midwives, medical techs, preventive medicine people, um, technicians, middle level people, nurses, they all train in Bhutan. They'll never train doctors there because there's just too few of them. But they do have, they're starting graduate, they want to do graduate medical education and research. They need research collaborators. I would like also to get some healthcare access people. When you look at their mountains and you look at your mountains, get some health economists. Let's get some economics here, which is driven by value instead of by profit, which is driven by ethics instead. Oh, this Bhutan's such a great place to work if you're driven by ethics, you know, because there's no money to be made because they won't let you make it and they won't let you take it out of the country. <laughs> so, but it's a great place to. So, so there are a lot of exciting opportunities here, but the problem is this is where our science is not enough to inform our public health decisions to say do this or do that, and it puts us at loggerheads with the, with the medical community who says, how can you not eradicate H. pylori and 90% of your people, high rates, high colonization, give me my guns, <laughs> you know, the, the cowboy mentality of, of clinical medicine. It's a wonderful place to work. So uh, that's, uh, that's why I wanted to kind of present it, and there, there are different ways. Um, I didn't want to go over too far, but thank you all for coming.